The only completely stationary object in the room was an enormous couch, on which two young women were buoyed up as though upon an anchored balloon. They were both in white, and their dresses were rippling and fluttering, as if they had just been blown back in after a short flight around the house. I must have stood for a few moments listening to the whip and snap of the curtains, and the groan of a picture on the wall. Then there was a boom as Tom Buchanan shut the rear windows, and the caught wind died out about the room, and the curtains and the rugs and the two young women ballooned slowly to the floor. The younger of the two was a stranger to me. She was extended full length at her end of the divan, completely motionless, and with her chin raised a little, as if she were balancing something on it which was quite likely to fall. If she saw me out of the corner of her eye she gave no hint of it. Indeed, I was almost surprised into murmuring an apology for having disturbed her by coming in. The other girl, Daisy, made an attempt to rise. She leaned slightly forward with a conscientious expression. Then she laughed, an absurd, charming little laugh, and I laughed too, and came forward into the room. "'I'm paralyzed with happiness!' She laughed again, as if she said something very witty, and held my hand for a moment, looking up into my face, promising that there was no one in the world she so much wanted to see. That was a way she had. She hinted in a murmur that the surname of the balancing girl was Baker. I've heard it said that Daisy's murmur was only to make people lean toward her, an irrelevant criticism that made it no less charming. At any rate, Miss Baker's lips fluttered, she nodded at me almost imperceptibly, and then quickly tipped her head back again. The object she was balancing had obviously tottered a little, and given her something of a fright. Again a sort of apology arose to my lips. Almost any exhibition of complete self-sufficiency draws a stunned tribute from me. I looked back at my cousin, who began to ask me questions in her low, thrilling voice. It was the kind of voice that the ear follows up and down, as if each speech is an arrangement of notes that will never be played again. Her face was sad and lovely with bright things in it, bright eyes and a bright, passionate mouth, but there was an excitement in her voice that men who had cared for her found difficult to forget. A singing compulsion, a whispered, Listen! a promise that she had done gay, exciting things just a while since, and that there were gay, exciting things hovering in the next hour. I told her how I had stopped off in Chicago for a day on my way east, and how a dozen people had sent their love through me. "'Do they miss me?' she cried ecstatically. "'The whole town is desolate.' All the cars have the left rear wheel painted black as a morning wreath, and there's a persistent wail all night along the north shore. How gorgeous! Let's go back, Tom, tomorrow. Then she added irrelevantly, You ought to see the baby. I'd like to. She's asleep. She's three years old. Haven't you ever seen her? Never. "'Well, you ought to see her. She's—' Tom Buchanan, who had been hovering restlessly about the room, stopped and rested his hand on my shoulder. "'What are you doing, Nick?' "'I'm a bond man.' "'Who with?' I told him. "'Never heard of them,' he remarked decisively. This annoyed me. "'You will,' I answered shortly. "'You will, if you stay in the East.' "'Oh, I'll stay in the East, don't you worry,' he said, glancing at Daisy, and then back at me, as if he were alert for something more. "'I'd be a goddamned fool to live anywhere else.' At this point Miss Baker said, "'Absolutely!' with such suddenness that I started. It was the first word she uttered since I came into the room." Evidently it surprised her as much as it did me, for she yawned, 
and with a series of rapid, deft movements, stood up into the room. "'I'm stiff,' she complained. "'I've been lying on that sofa for as long as I can remember.' "'Don't look at me,' Daisy retorted. "'I've been trying to get you to New York all afternoon.' "'No, thanks,' said Miss Baker, to the four cocktails just in from the pantry. "'I'm absolutely in training.' Her host looked at her incredulously. "'You are!' He took down his drink as if it were a drop in the bottom of a glass. "'How you ever get anything done is beyond me.' I looked at Miss Baker, wondering what it was she got done. I enjoyed looking at her. She was a slender, small-breasted girl, with an erect carriage, which she accentuated by throwing her body backward at the shoulders like a young cadet. Her grey, sun-strained eyes looked back at me with polite, reciprocal curiosity, out of a wan, charming, discontented face. It occurred to me now that I had seen her, or a picture of her, somewhere before. "'You live in West Egg,' she remarked contemptuously. "'I know somebody there.' "'I don't know a single—' "'You must know Gatsby.' "'Gatsby?' demanded Daisy. What Gatsby? Before I could reply that he was my neighbour, dinner was announced. Wedging his tense arm imperatively under mine, Tom Buchanan compelled me from the room, as though he were moving a checker to another square. Slenderly, languidly, their hands set lightly on their hips, the two young women preceded us out onto a rosy-coloured porch, open toward the sunset, where four candles flickered on the table in the diminished wind. "'Why candles?' objected Daisy, frowning. She snapped them out with her fingers. "'In two weeks it'll be the longest day in the year.' She looked at us all radiantly. "'Do you always watch for the longest day of the year?' and then miss it? I always watch for the longest day in the year, and then miss it. "'We ought to plan something,' yawned Miss Baker, sitting down at the table as if she were getting into bed. "'All right,' said Daisy. "'What'll we plan?' She turned to me helplessly. "'What do people plan?' Before I could answer, her eyes fastened with an awed expression on her little finger. "'Look,' she complained. I heard it. We all looked. The knuckle was black and blue. "'You did it, Tom,' she said accusingly. "'I know you didn't mean to, but you did do it. That's what I get for marrying a brute of a man, a great, big, hulking, physical specimen of a—' "'I hate that word, hulking,' objected Tom crossly, "'even in kidding.' "'Hulking,' insisted Daisy." Sometimes she and Miss Baker talked at once, unobtrusively, and with a bantering inconsequence that was never quite chatter, that was as cool as their white dresses and their impersonal eyes, in the absence of all desire. They were here, and they accepted Tom and me, making only a polite, pleasant effort to entertain or to be entertained. They knew that presently dinner would be over, and a little later the evening, too, would be over, and casually put away. It was sharply different from the West, where an evening was hurried from phase to phase toward its close, in a continually disappointed anticipation, or else in sheer nervous dread of the moment itself. "'You make me feel uncivilized, Daisy,' I confessed, on my second glass of corky but rather impressive claret. "'Can't you talk about crops or something?' I meant nothing in particular by this remark, but it was taken up in an unexpected way. "'Civilization's going to pieces,' broke out Tom violently. "'I've gotten to be a terrible pessimist about things. Have you read The Rise of the Coloured Empires by this man Goddard?' "'Why, no,' I answered, rather surprised by his tone. "'Well, it's a fine book,' and everybody ought to read it. The idea is, if we don't look out, the white race will be—will be utterly submerged, 
It's all scientific stuff. It's been proved. Tom's getting very profound, said Daisy, with an expression of unthoughtful sadness. He reads deep books with long words in them. What was that word we— Well, these books are all scientific, insisted Tom, glancing at her impatiently. This fellow has worked out the whole thing. It's up to us, who are the dominant race, to watch out, or these other races will have control of things. "'We've got to beat them down,' whispered Daisy, winking ferociously toward the fervent sun. "'You ought to live in California,' began Miss Baker, but Tom interrupted her by shifting heavily in his chair. "'This idea is that we're Nordics. I am, and you are, and you are, and—' After an infinitesimal hesitation, he included Daisy with a slight nod, and she winked at me again. "'And we've produced all the things that go to make civilization. Oh, science and art and all that. Do you see?' There was something pathetic in his concentration, as if his complacency, more acute than of old, was not enough to him any more. When almost immediately the telephone rang inside, and the butler left the porch, Daisy seized upon the momentary interruption, and leaned toward me. "'I'll tell you a family secret,' she whispered enthusiastically. "'It's about the butler's nose. Do you want to hear about the butler's nose?' "'That's why I came over to-night.' "'Well, he wasn't always a butler. He used to be the silver polisher for some people in New York that had a silver service for two hundred people. He had to polish it from morning till night, until finally it began to affect his nose. "'Things went from bad to worse,' suggested Miss Baker. "'Yes, things went from bad to worse, until finally he had to give up his position.' For a moment the last sunshine fell with romantic affection upon her glowing face. Her voice compelled me forward breathlessly as I listened. Then the glow faded, each light deserting her with lingering regret, like children leaving a pleasant street at dusk. The butler came back and murmured something close to Tom's ear, whereupon Tom frowned, pushed back his chair, and without a word went inside. As if his absence quickened something within her, Daisy leaned forward again, her voice glowing and singing. "'I love to see you at my table, Nick. You remind me of a—of a rose, an absolute rose, doesn't he?' She turned to Miss Baker for confirmation. "'An absolute rose?' This was untrue. I am not even faintly like a rose.' She was only extemporizing, but a stirring warmth flowed from her, as if her heart was trying to come out to you concealed in one of those breathless, thrilling words. Then suddenly she threw her napkin on the table and excused herself, and went into the house. 